everybody. Welcome to Coffee Time Q&A. This is Pastor Steve Roby along with Adam the Mad Hatter. Hey, guys. How we doing? Rastetter. And over here, we got Noah, the barefoot dude. Greetings, children. Schaefer. I'm actually wearing shoes today. <laughs> you are wearing <laughs> shoes. It's chilly. You've been wearing shoes more often. I've noticed that. Yeah. I don't know why. <laughs> I've changed. <laughs> you are changing. <laughs> A long time, yeah. long time barefoot man. That's true. Hey, uh, we are back again for another episode. Uh, we got another listener question, mm -hmm. uh, maybe question, at least a statement we have. Uh, but we're going to kick it around after we cheers and cheers. drink this coffee, which is a mix of Ethiopian. What was Col it? Ethiopian and Colombian. Same from yeah. last week, yeah. the, the which is crazy. The transcontinental. We all wore coffee. the same clothes too. <laughs> yeah, every Fun. week. Cheers, mate. Cheers. <laughs> Still good. It's so nice to record in the morning when I normally drink coffee versus adding coffee mm -hmm. in the afternoons. Yeah, Monday nights I'm usually I'm usually up pretty late because of coffee time. <laughs> <laughs> it is. I'm just anxious until like 11 p.m. <laughs> All right. Well, we got a barn burner today because this is a a, a statement that's going to kind of lead into some conversation that can go all over the place, but. Nevertheless, we're here to have a conversation, and Adam's going to read what we received. All right, here's what we got. During the second coming, Zechariah says that Jesus will be touching down on the Mount of Olives. But according to Revelation 19, his purpose is to fight the battle of Armageddon. And there you have it. <laughs> if you ever want to submit a difficult question for us. <laughs> Don't submit a question at all. <laughs> submit a statement <laughs> and make us talk about it. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I assume, you know, we, we kind of talked about this pre-record that it, the perceived inconsistency is the location, right? So you have, if Zechariah 14 yeah. refers to Jesus's second coming, right? Mm -hmm. And... We have reference to the Battle of Armageddon in the book of Revelation. If they're the same event, then why, why does one say he's coming to um, the Mount of Olives, which is, I looked it up, 132 kilometers away from Armageddon, which translated literally means Hill of Megiddo. They think that's Megiddo would be 132 kilometers away from uh, the Mount of Olives. And so that's about 80 two miles ish away. Mass. So, so maybe behind yeah. this, behind this, he's trying to reconcile. Is this the same event? Are we talking mm -hmm. about the second coming in Zechariah 14? I think so. Yeah. I, I think that's what, I think that's what's behind the statement question mm -hmm. statement. Yeah. <laughs> in times. So many places we could go. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> yeah. So let's, well, uh, let's, let's read them. Go ahead and read Zechariah 14. You what does that it one, say? Noah? Yeah, I can read that. Do you want me to, where do, we, where do we want to start? Just like the specific verse where it re references him coming. Maybe to the, the first four verses, would you say? Sure. First couple of verses are kind of intense, uh, viewer warning. Uh, Behold, a day is coming for the Lord when the spoil taken from you will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem, Jerusalem to battle. And the city shall be taken and the house is plundered and the women raped. Half of the city shall go out into exile, but the rest of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as when he fights on the day of battle. On that day, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lie before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, a very wide valley, so that on one half of the mount shall be moved northward and the other half southward. Yeah. And then we have, so the reference there, Jesus coming to the Mount of Olives. Yeah. There's reference to a splitting, right, of the earth yep. um, to east and west. Um, and then in the book of Revelation, he, he mentioned Revelation 19, um, but the Battle of Armageddon is not specifically mentioned there. It's actually mentioned in Revelation 16. I'll talk about that, and then I'll let you read the 19 sure. piece. Yep. So in, in Revelation 16, you have the seven bowls of God's wrath being poured out. And towards the end of that chapter, it says uh, that there, this is in verse 18, it says there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunders, and a great earthquake such as there had never been since man was on the earth. So great was that earthquake. The great city was split into three parts. So here we have another splitting of the earth, but it's three parts, not two. Yeah. Is it a reference to the same event 
or not. Maybe that's, again, we're, we're speculating whether or not that's what he's getting at. Um, but then down in verse 21, it says, Great hailstones, about 100 pounds each, fell from heaven on people, and they cursed God for the plague of the hill because the plague was so severe. Um, it was up in verse 16 that shows the assembly of nations gathered. And it says they assembled them at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. So that's where Armageddon is specifically mentioned as a location, um, which, again, Har Megiddo likely refers to the hill of Megiddo, which is about 80 miles away from the Mount of Olives. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you have in chapter 19. Chapter the, 19, then we have the rider on the white horse. Um, and so this is referring to Jesus' second coming. And so I'm going to read... Revelation nineteen fourteen through 16. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white, horse, white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God, the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Yeah. All right. So, um, just thinking through like how to, how to, you know, proceed, you know, when you look at what takes place in the next chapter of revelation 20, yeah, you have this assembly, right? If we call it Armageddon, that would be the reference in 16. You have the assemblies of the nations against the people of God gathered, having encircled them, ready to distinguish or extinguish the people of God, but it never takes place. And here's why it says in Revelation 20, it says, when the thousand years are ended, talking about the end of the millennium period, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. So we believe this to be the battle of Armageddon getting ready Mm -hmm. to take place. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. But it says, fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and false prophet were. And they were tormented day and night forever and ever. So... uh, and I think, so it depends, we, we were talking about how this depends so much on your framework of eschatology, whether if you're approaching this from an amillennialist view, a postmillennialist view, or a historical premillennial view, or a dispensational premillennial view, you'll have different thoughts on this. What, what I think is, you know, been so pervasive over the last few decades has been this dispensational premillennial view, largely informed by the fictional books of Tim LaHaye's Left Behind Behind series. series. I was joking with him before that I should have brought my copies of the books as my sole references for this conversation. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) but no, no. (laughs) But even more so, you know, the the prophecy guru, at least self-proclaimed, is Hal Lindsey, you know, in his book, The Late Great Planet Earth, who have just set the world sort of in a frenzy on their views and interpretations of the possibilities of end-time events, um, looking specifically at things in the culture and reading into them, interpreting them in light of how does this all fit together. Now, I want to. what I think would be helpful is to paint a picture of that view, which I reject, um, but it is helpful to paint a picture of that and, and how that fits together with this statement uh, made um, that we received. And that is, you know, in this dispensational sort of premillennial view, there's a belief that Christ will return and secretly rapture the church, right? Mm -hmm. And then after the secret rapture of the church, there will be a period of seven years of great tribulation. Um, And during that seven-year period, God has a separate plan to save Israel, um, and the, the temple will be rebuilt on its, you know, historic ground. Uh, Worship will be restored in Israel. Um, Many uh, of Israelites will be saved during that period. 
then the raising up of the Antichrist will come towards the end of that, mm-hmm. who initially there's, there's peace with Israel, but then will deceive the nations and ultimately bring war against the people of God, the Antichrist himself, in Hal Lindsey's view at least, yeah. will bring the armies from, from Europe, the European armies. They, they often tie the European Union and sort of a one world government to these interpretations. Um, so the Antichrist will lead the armies from Europe, from the West, to, like usually link the Chinese to bring in the armies from the East. Mm-hmm. And then you have Russia, Gog and Magog com- coming sure. from the North. And you have the Arab nations coming from the South, all encircling Israel for this battle of Armageddon. But then you have Christ returning, s- touching down on the Mount of Olives with a breath, wipes them out, consumes them by fire, Revelation mm-hmm. 20. Mm-hmm. And, and it all comes to a halt. He puts the enemy under his footstool and then establishes his physical millennial reign on earth. That I think that's where a lot of people have sort of read, you know, these books and sort of constructed that type of view of end time events, which is really not even close to what I think. Um, so that's the, Bible the pre-mill. Presents. It, now in, in Dispensational that, pre-mill, yeah. Dispens- so is that... Is that the rapture then, or that's that all happens after the rapture? It happens after the that rapture. Happens, that all that happens view. after the yeah. rapture, according to that view. And so, yeah. And, and so the church isn't there, right? However, right. a traditional amillennialist view, and we're gonna we're gonna do a, an episode next week, yeah, to kind of to. sum this up because I think there's gonna be a lot of confusion. Um, mm-hmm. At least sum up the classic four frameworks of eschatology, end times yeah. views, amillennialism. Ah, millennialism, post-millennialism, pre-millennialism in a historic sense, and then pre-millennialism in a um, dispensational sense, which is right. the youngest of the four views. Mm-hmm. We're going to need to do a lot of vocal warm-ups before, uh, <laughs> yeah. before that episode. I can't get all the words out. Like, man, I keep getting tongue-tied. Big words. I keep, yeah. getting, I keep getting tongue-tied. Um, but I... Th- if his question has to do with geography, then it looks like Jesus touches down on the Mount of Olives. If if you're interpreting this literally, which I, I would not as an amillennialist, it, it, then he, with a breath of fire, he wipes out all the armies that have assembled for Armageddon and then establishes his, his thousand year reign. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's not a view that I would, would yeah. hold. Yeah. So what you're saying is, depending on how you view all of end times, they're it changes you're how think you about think the about the prophecies different. Yeah. 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 So like, you know, someone who me, like me who believes that Jesus has established his kingdom on the earth in the, the church age mm-hmm. is the same as the kingdom age. Um, and that's not a view that the dispensationalists would hold. That's a separate age, right? So you have the yeah. dispensationalist would hold the church age as sort of a parenthesis between the age of Israel and then the age of the kingdom. Um, whereas the church age is synonymous with the kingdom age and in, in a millennialist view that Jesus established his kingdom on earth and is now reigning through through his church who's been given the keys of the kingdom. Um, so that's why I was saying this conversation can go all over the place. Um, but I think if, if what he's getting at is geography and trying to fit it together in a literal sense, then I think it works. I think Zechariah 14 would refer to a, a physical touching down on the Mount of Olives and from 82 miles away, <laughs> Jesus wipes out these armies that have encamped and circled around uh, Israel, mm-hmm. which I think in Revelation 20 is actually referring to the church because it says the camp of the saints, which is yeah. often the you know the saints or the or the church. Um, but in that in that view, the church has already been raptured and taken out. So I don't believe in a secret rapture, and I'll, we'll talk about that too next week. And um, but then. He also refers to the beloved city, which in Revelation refers to the heavenly Jerusalem, mm-hmm. um, which is, you know, it is the church. So, but if you believe it in a literal Israel Israel sense, and, and part of this craze has come because Israel in 1948 became official again as a city, as a, yeah. as a national state. Um, and that just kind of ramped up all of the um, prophetic... Yeah. references to Israel in the Old Testament, especially. I remember that. We had a neighbor who like quit his job in 1988 and he was ready. I mm-hmm. mean, he was, I mean, he, he was devoting all his time to spend with the Lord. And, you know, obviously he thought for sure it's like 1988 was the year, Yeah, you know, so. Yeah. And I, I would probably just, I'd probably close with this and then see if you guys got any final thoughts. Is sure. like the, you know, that the idea that God has a separate plan for Israel. And I'm not denying that 
you know, there is some merit, you know, Paul references it in Romans 11 that he says all Israel will be saved. But what does he mean by that? Um, so there, there does seem to be an ingathering of Jews who, who are converted to Christ in the Bible, um, that I believe that that will happen towards the end. However, to, to suggest that God has a separate plan of economy of salvation for the church and for Israel totally negates Paul's teaching in Ephesians on why God breaks down the wall of hostility between Jews and Gentiles. Mm -hmm. Um, the whole point was there's one faith, one baptism, one Lord, one church, one people of God. And so I, I reject dispensationalism. Some people by dispensationalism, I've heard MacArthur say this, mm -hmm. is that he, what he means by dispensationalism that he holds is just simply that, that God has a special place and, you know, in his heart for Israel still today, that God hasn't completely forsaken Israel. And I don't know what, what that fully means, but just that there's an acknowledgement that the ethnic Jews still exist and that they're, there's in some way that's wrapped up into salvation towards the end, towards the end of the age. But to, to, to think that there's a separate plan, um, I think negates a lot of New Testament teaching and, you know, I reject dispensational views for, for that reason. Yeah. Any final thoughts from you guys? Great conversation. I'm looking forward to next week where we can actually like sit down and talk through all the definitions yeah. of these views. Cause the statement that was submitted definitely like leads into that because your opinions on location, what actually happens. Literal um, or ex figurative. Exactly. Yeah. That all kind of depends on, like you said at the beginning, depends on your view. So yeah. mm -hmm. I'm stoked on it. It's very interesting to talk about. So the statement was, it was given to us by a coworker of Rodney's who, yeah. um, you know, through Rodney has told us that this is a, an educated man who's got a master's degree in church history and theology or something like that. And so I, we should probably actually have him on here to come and talk. I'm not sure where he, what he was wanting to know with this or what gather our thoughts. I hope we're, that was helpful for you, brother. Um, <laughs> but if not, let us know and maybe ask a, a clarifying question. That'd be great. For sure. Any final thoughts from you, Adam? No, I, that's all. Awesome. <laughs> well, you want to wrap us up? Sounds great. Um, yeah. If you got questions, submit them to wc.life. I'm looking at the main camera now, not this one. Looking over here. Uh, make sure you like and subscribe. It helps the channel out a lot. Um, the The whole purpose of this podcast isn't necessarily just to discuss, but to also get the word of God and, and the gospel out um, to as many platforms as we can. So Amen. share it with your friends, subscribe, like, comment, let us know if you got more questions and uh, we'll see you next week. Amen. Peace out. Peace.